welcome you uh, here tonight. And uh, it's the beginning of several very interesting uh, seminars that we're going to be putting on here at AES. I'd like this time to turn it over to Troy Stangaron, who is our Director of Trade. Troy? Thank you, Congressman Manzuela. Um, and thank you all for being here tonight. Um, as many of you all know, over recent years, uh, we have seen significant discussion and action on the development of a new economic architecture in Asia. Uh, much of it has centered around the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but we also have seen movement on the Asian side with the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership and also in the trilateral uh, negotiations between Korea, China, and Japan. Um, today we brought together speakers from um, the United States, South Korea, Japan, and China to talk about the different players' perspectives within the region on economic integration, what the obstacles are, what some of the benefits are, and how this might all play out. Um, so what I'll do is I'm going to go through and briefly introduce our speakers, and we'll go in the order of my uh, left on down the panel, and um, we'll have, to have about 15 minutes of remarks from each speaker, and then we'll open it up to discussion. Um, to my immediate left, we have Dr. Uh, Zhang Xiaotong. Um, he is the executive director of Wuhan the Wuhan University Center for Economic Diplomacy, executive director for the Wuhan University and the University of West Indies Center for Caribbean Studies, and associate professor of the School of Political Science and Public Administration at Wuhan University. He used to work at the U.S. Mission to the Euro or sorry, at the U.S. desk of the Chinese Ministry of Commerce and serve as the trade attaché at the Chinese Mission to the European Union in Brussels between 2004 and 2010. He obtained his Ph.D. Uh, in political science at the Université Libre uh, de Bruxelles in Belgium. Uh, to his left is Dr. Um, Sa Jin Kyu. Um, he is a senior research fellow at the Korea Institute for International Economic Policy in Seoul. Uh, Kia is a leading institute concerning the international economy in Korea, and he also advises the government on all, or Kiev, excuse me, advises the government on all major um, international economic policy issues. Um, Dr. Sa is a senior, is a policy advisor uh, for the Ministry of Trade, Industry, and Energy, and also a news commentator on the Korean broadcasting system. He has both a PhD and an MS in Agricultural and Resource Economics from the University of Maryland College Park in the United States, and an MA and a BS in Agricultural Economics from Korea University in Seoul. To Dr. Sa's left is Dr. Takashi Tereda. Uh, Dr. Tereda is a professor of international relations at Doshia University in Kyoto, Japan. He received his PhD from Australian National University in 1999. Before taking up his current position in April 2012, he was an assistant professor at the National University of Singapore and an associate and full professor at Wasada University. He also served as a visiting professor at the University of Warwick in the UK and a <coughs> Japan scholar at the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. And last but not least is Matthew Goodman, who is the William E. Simon Chair in Political Science at the Center for International and Strategic Studies in Washington, D.C. Prior to joining CSIS, uh, Mr. Goodman was the White House Coordinator for the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation and the East Asia Summits. He also served as Director for International Economics on the National Security Council staff and responsible for the G20, G8, and other international forum. Prior to joining the White House, Mr. Goodman was Senior Advisor to the Undersecretary for Economic, Energy, and Agricultural Affairs at the U.S. Department of State. Um, his private sector experience includes five years at Goldman Sachs, where he headed the Tokyo and, Wash and London offices. Uh, Mr. Goodman holds an MA in International Relations from John Hopkins of International Studies and a BS from, perhaps most importantly, uh, my graduate alma mater at the London School of Economics as well. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Zhang. Thank you. Thank you, Choi. Um, thank you for having me here. Um, it's always... Um, very difficult to be the first speaker. Um, but it's also privileged to be the first speaker because um, I can cover something um, without uh, constraint. Um, uh, actually, um, what I'm going to talk about today um, is how China uh, views TPP, uh, how China views RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, as well as China, South Korea, Japan, FTA. And also I will make some predictions about 
um, China's future actions in Asian economic uh, integration. Um, before embarking on um, China's views, China's positions of these uh, regional economic integration initi initiatives, I would like to say a few uh, words about uh, the overall context facing China uh, with some historical dimensions. Uh, we all know that uh, since the um, end of 2012, um, we've got a new generation of leadership represented by President Xi Jinping. Uh, he's now in Europe. Uh, I guess that uh, he needs to convince his European counterparts uh, that China, um, on the one hand, will f continue to forge a strong partnership with Russia, but on the other hand, uh, maintain a very good partnership with Europe. They, he also met with President Obama talking about a new type of uh, uh, major country relationship. We don't say talk. About, we don't say great power relationship. We prefer using. Um, the word major country because China doesn't still doesn't see it as a great power because using the word great power uh, reminds people of um, the first world war, second world war, the, the, the struggle among great powers. So that actually reflects how China uh, views itself and its uh, relationship with other countries. Um, so what is priority for China now, for China's economic policy as well as China's diplomacy? I think China is still quite development oriented. So its focus um, is largely how to further and deepen China's domestic market and how to handle uh, the relationship between uh, market and government. So. China's own understanding of political economy. Um, many people have a lot of expectations of China and often um, have a critical view of China's diplomacy. And it, within China itself, uh, the scholars and policymakers are having a debate about whether China should continue to keeping a low profile diplomacy or instead China should go towards a more proactive diplomacy. Um, I would say China is in the transitional period in terms of its uh, foreign economic policy and economic diplomacy as well as trade policy. Uh, we are moving uh, from keeping a low profile to a more proactive uh, way of dealing with our neighbors and our major partners. That being said, China does not or has not yet given up uh, keeping low profile. Um, China is trying to keep a delicate balance between these two because we have both supporters for keeping low profile, in particular uh, those senior dip, uh, diplomats as well as the old generation of leaders. But also we are seeing uh, a younger generation of leaders more and more proactive. Um, they believe that due to China's interest uh, and extended interest overseas, China need to be more um, proactive. Um, what China has done over the past two years, uh, one and a half years, uh, basically China has done a lot of um, reform and opening up. We believe that reform and opening up are uh, mutually complementary. We're using opening up as a good vehicle for pushing further domestic reforms. Uh, often we use these two words, reform and op opening up, uh, in, a, in the same sense. Um, on the front of further opening up, uh, you know that Shanghai has newly established itself into a free trade zone. And the central government of China wants to copy the model of Shanghai free trade zone to other cities, including the city Wuhan, where I am now teaching, and maybe also to Tianjin, for example, the second round of free trade zones, Tianjin, Guangdong, even Chongqing. Um, at the same time, we are upgrading China ASEAN FTA. 
uh, which is a major uh, economic initiative announced during the visit by our Prime, Minister, Prime Premier Li Keqiang um, in Southeast, a a Southeast Asian countries. We um, started to negotiate China SFTA with the initiative uh, by the then Chinese Prime Minister Zhu Rongji back in 2000. And until 2010, we finally completed this China ASEAN FTA. Um, we think now it's time for us to, to go further, uh, including more tariff reductions, more services liberalizations, more investment uh, liberalizations. Uh, also, China is uh, doing bilateral FTAs, for example, with some developed economies, including uh, Switzerland and also Iceland. Um, and China, back in 2012, even proposed doing an FTA with the European Union, as Japan is, uh, is now doing well with the European Union. Um, we suggested doing a feasibility uh, study together with the European Commission. But so far, uh, the European Commission uh, prefers doing a bilateral investment treaty with China first uh, to, to see whether China uh, is um, fully committed to going towards that direction of further trade and li uh, investment liberalization. Um, we also know that China's economy um, is no longer as 10 years before growing too digital. Uh, uh, now we aiming at 7.5% economic growth for the year 2014. And last year we achieved 7.7% .7 of economic growth. But we do have a lot of concerns including uh, air pollutions um, and also we're taking more and more care about how people feeding uh, and we're aiming at the so-called scientific way of development. So in the future, um, the overall context is that China's priority is still uh, many domestic and many development prioritized, but we are using more and more opening up as vehicles for pushing harder domestic reforms facing increasing domestic resistances. Um, the second part I would like to elaborate a bit upon uh, is China's views of TPP. Um, as I just said, China started FTA negotiation with ASEAN back in 2000, and we completed in 2010. And the TPP started, I think, it was, uh, I mean, with the U.S. Uh, deep involvement back in 2008 and 2009. Uh, actually, China, I would say, was was quite surprised when when the U.S. side announced pivoting towards Asia, um, because for 10 years between China and ASEAN. I mean, our premier called it a golden 10 years. We've done a lot of economic integration. Uh, and all of a sudden, the US announced pivoting back towards Asia. And actually, they didn't really do much except TPP. I mean, in terms of military uh, preparedness, they simply added a few hundred soldiers, combat forces in a few places. But for TPP, I think that they are quite serious. And that really caught China a surprise. And that stir up a series of responses uh, from the Chinese side together with the ASEAN side. <coughs> For China, we view TPP um, as a diplomatic and strategic vehicle uh, carrying the United States back to Asia on the one hand. But on the other hand, we see that the TPP has a lot of economic impl implications. Uh, in my paper, uh, we, we, we made some uh, analysis um, although we haven't done uh, quantitative analysis, we made some qualitative analysis, uh, seeing that the TPP has a very high ambition, in particular in the area of state-owned enterprises, uh, competition neutrality, uh, labor, right, labor, right, labor conditions, environmental standards, etc., which China believes are still too high for us to reach. And that's a very important consideration why China has not uh, uh, is not, uh, does not join TPP. Of course, people are also talking about uh, the diplomatic strategic consideration for the U.S. to push through TPP. Um, 
So also, I believe China has some considerations. But actually, uh, when I served in the Ministry of Commerce, I think that for some time, for a period of time, we, we are very serious in reflecting upon whether China should join the TPP. And I think this reflection is still ongoing. People are still thinking about whether it's time for China to join the TPP, maybe in a, in a later period uh, stage. Um, it's still uncertain. Um, but from the policy reactions, we can see that uh, China obviously opted for uh, China, Korea, Japan, FTA, and also for RCEP instead of TPP. I would say a large number of Chinese policymakers, uh, I mean scholars, they believe that TPP is not in the best interest of China, but still a minority of Chinese scholars and policymakers believe that TPP is in the best interest of China because China is pushing through a all-round and deepened reform. Uh, people like us who, who, who participated in China's WTO accession negotiation can feel that China is again on the eve of the second round of, of trade and investment and liberalization. Of course, there are differences uh, between our t t today's China and uh, uh, 15 years ago when Premier Zhu Rongji, President uh, Jiang Zemin was in office. Um, finally, um, I would like to say a few words about um, China's future path, path of Asian economic integration. I think there are at least um, four broad sets of questions facing China's future path of economic uh, Asian economic integration. One is multilateralism versus regionalism, bilateralism. I think it's still a ve very valid question. China um, obviously still um, thinking about pushing through at the same time multilateralist and regional and bilateral um, paths. Um, we haven't decided yet which path is best and which path requires the largest amount of energy and time. The second broad set of question is competing regionalism or harmonious regionalism or competing bilateralism or harmonious bilateralism. People are talking about that there are a lot of competitions between TPP and RCEP, uh, also um, China, Japan, South Korea, FTA. Uh, whether China wants to use uh, RCEP and China J CJK FTA as a strategic vehicle in counterbalancing the U.S. increasing role, I mean, it remains a question. The third broad set of questions is whether China would continue to go ahead with its deep round, deep deepened reform and open up or not, because we are facing more and more domestic resistances. And the fourth round of uh, broad set of questions is whether China lead, will lead or follow in Asia economic integration. My per I personally believe that China will choose to lead um, because China is uh, such a big country and China is now in the process of so-called peaceful rise. Um, it's very difficult for China just to follow because to follow you can never um, ever rise in a complete sense. A uh, last point I want to mention is that China is not only doing um, on its eastern coast Asian economic integration, but China is also doing a lot of economic interconnectivity and economic integration with its western neighbors, mainly through um, the so-called Silk Road economic, economic Belt Initiative. Of course, we're also doing another maritime Silk Road with ASEAN all the way through Indian Ocean until the eastern coast of Africa, the so-called Maritime Silk Road. Uh, with that, I um, end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jay. Dr. Sir. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, and uh, 
I'm Jin Kyu Sir uh, from uh, South Korea. At, uh, actually, I'm working at the KIEP. The KIEP is the Korea International at uh, Korea Institute for International Economic Policy, and uh, my institute, KIEP, is uh, one of the best uh, think tank in South Korea, and uh, its major role is uh, support Korean government by providing the. Uh, policy recommendation on all kinds of international economic issues. Um, and today, the, what I want to talk with you is uh, following uh, four arguments. Uh, of course, uh, those arguments uh, relate to the Korea's role in the economic integration in the East Asia. And uh, my first argument is uh, just uh, about the meaning of uh, Japan's uh, participation in TPP. Uh, you know, uh, the Japan uh, formally joined uh, TPP negotiation in the last uh, July 2013, and um, I think uh, the TPP, the Japan's joining the TPP uh, is a uh, 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 cause a little bit a uh, loss of balance between RCEP and TPP, which has been maintained uh, by that time. Uh, let me give you uh, one e example. And if you see in the screen, and uh, you can see there are some the two uh, pie chart, and both uh, pie chart and uh, shows a GDP share of TPP and RCEP. And pi in the left-hand side is case of TPP-11, which uh, Japan is not included. And the uh, right-hand side pi, also the uh, case of TPP-12, which Japan uh, inc is included. And uh, as you see uh, in the screen, the uh, GDP share of RCEP in both, chi, both the pie chart as uh, almost a 29%, uh, which is similar to the uh, case of TPP-11. However, the GDP share of TPP-12 is almost 38%, and uh, uh, almost a 10% point gap between TPP-11 and TPP-12. So, uh, I know, uh, I uh, fully understand the difficult situation of Japan during the last uh, two decades. And so I thought uh, the Japan's participation in the DPP uh, might be a uh, best option for revitalizing its economy. But uh, at the same time, I think it is also true that uh, uh, Japan's joined the DPP caused the uh, uh, equilibrium between competing two mega uh, the FTA, like uh, uh, TPP and RCEP, as uh, cause these two uh, uh, the uh, equilibrium shift to the TPP, not the uh, RCEP. So uh, I think uh, the most Asian country uh, began to modify or change its uh, regional trade policy in compliance with such a changed environments. And that's uh, one uh, my uh, the, uh, that's first my uh, point. And second is uh, Korea's view on TPP. And actually, the, uh, uh, everyone in this uh, panel knows TPP very well. And uh, is it clear? Uh, I think uh, TPP really uh, has a potential to be a new. Uh, uh, trade uh, uh, norm for international trade. And so uh, as uh, Korea and uh, ranked uh, six, uh, six, seventh, yeah, seventh largest exporter and also 12th uh, largest economy in the world, I think Korea need to join the TPP negotiation quickly. But uh, as I uh, uh, said before, and the situation in, is not so simple. And uh, particularly, and if you consider the contents of a TPP negotiation, and then uh, you can understand what I'm saying. And the contents of a TPP 
is really beyond China's acceptance limit. So although the TPP does not intend to marginalize China in the East Asia, but actually, actually, the TPP is isolating China in this region. Uh, that is uh, my uh, uh, the thinking, and uh, uh, particularly, I I also the, uh, the China is the most uh, important trading partner of Korea, and uh, bilateral trade with China uh, covers a quarter of Korea's total export. Also, as you see in the screen, and uh, trade, Korea's trade surplus with uh, China has amounted to the more than $50 billion in 2012. It's almost twice the Korea's total trade surplus. And I think uh, this uh, uh, trend continued in the last year, 2013. And also, uh, I, 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 I will show the another screen. Is uh, uh, China also has a very important uh, influence on the uh, process of North Korea decision making, which is uh, directly related to the national securities of South Korea. So in, a, in, in this such a situation, it is not so easy for Korea to decide join TPP. And so uh, I think the, the, those are significant uh, factor uh, cannot be ignored. And uh, this is uh, my the second point. And third point is uh, about the relate to the Korea's view on RCEP. Okay, and the most scholars uh, point out our service is less uh, ambitious than TPP because of uh, flexibility clause. Yes, I, I agree with that. Uh, but I think the flexibility can be a strength of our set. And you know, the one important feature of Asian society is its dynamic, its dynasty diversity. So I think the flexibility, you know, for example, uh, the, uh, the per capita GDP of Myanmar is just uh, uh, below the $1,000, but while the debt of Singapore is more than $50,000. So the, I think the flexibility is an essential factor for allowing the Asian country to integrate. So I think the, because of uh, the flexibility, the RCEP can be a superior to TPP in the economic integration in East Asia. This is uh, my third uh, 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 point. And of course, uh, flexibility uh, has a pros and cons. Uh, sometimes uh, flexibility uh, could help the break a deadlock or find a good compromise in a very difficult situation on this negotiation. But the uh, other, uh, other case, uh, the pro flexibility could uh, curtail or limit the progress of uh, further or great uh, liberalization in, um, in terms of particularly the market access. So I think at the uh, potential loophole, which is uh, disguised as a uh, uh, flexibility should be minimized by the political will of our safe economy. And that is why I emphasize that the strong leadership uh, is indispensable to uh, uh, the conclusion of our safe negotiation successfully. And, uh, and then uh, the, my the last Yeah, and then my last uh, uh, argument is like that. And anyway, uh, uh, it is a uh, not so easy a uh, situation for Korea to 
uh, decide to join the TPP or not. And, but at the same time, I think uh, the Korea doesn't want to be excluded in the rulemaking process of, uh, for the future international uh, uh, trade. And so uh, what should Korea do? And my solution is uh, some natural, as a dual, uh, dual track approach. Uh, in other words, on the one hand, and Korea pursue to entry into TPP, but on the other, and Korea makes its best effort to conclude the RCEP negotiation by 2015. But the, uh, the conclusion of RCEP by 2015 should be based on the uh, bilateral free trade negotiation with China or a CJKA, China, uh, Japan, is, is a Korea trilateral uh, FTA negotiation. That's uh, uh, my uh, the basic uh, uh, framework for dual track approach. Here. And uh, uh, in the screen, and uh, uh, I uh, can summarize my idea. And if you see in the screen, in the step 1-1 one one is just uh, as soon as uh, only a conclusion of uh, the bilateral, cons bilateral FTA with China. And I think the, the Korea-China FTA can be a free uh, condition for a successful conclusion of RCEP negotiation as well as the CJK uh, trilateral FTA negotiation. And uh, furthermore, the Korea-China FTA could be utilized as a kinds of insurance when the Korea failed to the uh, joint TPP negotiation. Okay. And uh, second, also the, uh, right now the Korean government is pushing the bilateral consultation with the TPP member country. And uh, I was told that the first round of bilateral consultation has already uh, concluded, finished, and I expect the uh, second round of bilateral consultation with the uh, TPP member country, <coughs> excuse me, um, will be uh, uh, finished uh, in the near future. And s but uh, what I'm saying is a really important thing is the, the final decision on entry into the TPP should be subject to the result of bilateral consultation. In other words, if the entry cost is uh, small enough for Korea to bear, and then Korea will directly uh, join the TPP negotiation. But if the entry cost is huge, and then Korea uh, will uh, give up uh, joining the DPP instead of DPP, and then Korea pursue to the CJK uh, uh, trilateral FTA negotiation or uh, reduced form of uh, RCEP negotiation. What I mean, the reduced form of RCEP, the implied uh, can be a, a either a reduced number, a uh, reduced number of participants or a uh, reduced uh, context of market liberalization. And that is um, uh, my basic idea. And uh, let me conclude my uh, 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 part. And uh, I think uh, Korea should carefully select the best feature of Asian, current Asian FTA track. In this track, Korea could play uh, uh, important balanced role among the China and Japan and ASEAN. Furthermore, based on the bilateral FTA with China and United States, you know the course FTA has already effectuated, and Korea can also, the Korea could, could play a very important role in linking uh, RCEP with the uh, TPP. Uh, that's uh, uh, my the two uh, final conclusion. And uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your attendance. Thank you, Dr. Sa. Dr. Chereda? Yep. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the uh, organizers of this conference and KEI, uh, particularly you and uh, uh, Nicholas, uh, working so hard. Um, my, my talk today focusing on Japan TPP because this is the United States. 
Uh, I was in Jakarta last month, and my topic was Japan, ASEAN, and RCP. And next month, uh, I'm coming to Seoul for another think tank conference, ASAM. Um, I'm talking on Japan, the Northeast Asia integration, CJK. Why am I able to choose different frameworks? It was simply because Japan has been participating in negotiations of all regional integration frameworks. Japan has been also negotiating with the European Union for FTA, just like the United States is doing with the European Union. So currently, the Japan's trade in both ways has been covered by FTA partners, which are mainly uh, Southeast Asian countries, as well as ASEAN. Uh, it's about eight, 19, 18 or 90%. But if all of them are concluding, concluded successfully, the ratio actually would go up to the 83-84%. That would probably exceed the uh, portion of the South Korea, Japan's current rival uh, uh, in FTA competition. So this diagram uh, just illustrates the, uh, where Japan is located and uh, all framework we just I mentioned. So around one, just I put color, blue, uh, light blue, and water blue, and et cetera. Uh, it's based on ASEAN. And ASEAN plus three, ASEAN plus six framework are now merged to a new name, RCP, but well, thanks to China's uh, concessions. Uh, Japan has been strongly supporting ASEAN plus six, while China for ASEAN plus three. But in 2011, a um, joint proposal by Japan and China for making the forward the East Asian framework by making a concession, particularly through China. And now the ASEAN Plus 6 framework, named RCP, has been uh, going on. Currently, we just finished fourth and maybe fifth round. Also, CJK, uh, in the central part, uh, was also made possible after the uh, China's concession as well. And uh, initially, Japan and Korea, in this case, were in the same position uh, to ask China to join the uh, CJK investment treaty, because a lot of Japanese and Korean companies and investing in uh, China had huge you know, problems and in terms of the investment. Uh, and China said, no, FTA should be concluded first. So this sort of the, you know, different views have continued to exist until again uh, late 2000. But I mentioned China's uh, concession. China said, that's fine, okay, we should conclude investment treaty first. And now after that, as China hoped, CJK FTA negotiations has been going on. We just finished fourth round last month, I guess. Why China made the concessions? This is partly related to the another regional framework which is currently penetrating into round or carat frameworks in a diagram, TPP. And the US just found it's useful for challenging this trade uh, competition dominated by China in East Asia. And Japan also joined it in 2006 by proposing the ASEAN plus six framework. Probably much you should know about it, somewhere in the White House called Nikkei Shok. Because Nikkei is the name of the trade minister of Japan and never consulted with the United States on proposing it. Of course, never com uh, conclu uh, consulting with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Japan. So, plus six framework excluding the United States, despite the fact that US and Japan are both allied nations. This is the reason why 2006, an epic meeting in Hanoi, RCP, sorry, uh, FTAP, Free Trade Asia in Asia Pacific, epic wide FTA was first time uh, put into the epic leaders meeting declaration. Since then, FTAP was often quoted by APEC uh, company, uh, meetings, and et cetera. And after that, still APTAP was considered to be, well, even now, quite difficult to realize, partly because of maybe Taiwan's participation, partly because of the uh, huge uh, you know, the economic gap. You can just find the uh, smaller countries in terms of economic size, Papua New Guinea, for example. Um, Papua New Guinea is forging the FTA with the United States. I mean, I've never heard of that. So I think the APEC, just you know, the diversify, diversity is a quite strong characteristics. And that would certainly help for you know, the economic growth, but also weak point is very difficult to integrate. 
So TPP just started by four smaller nations of the APEC economy in 2007. What sort of the something which United States, United States won't appreciate? And the important thing is to invite more economies into framework to create critical mass. And Japan was considered to be quite a significant uh, country by United States at that time in this context. In 2010, the Prime Minister was coming out of, after Hatoyama was some disastrous attempt to promote East Asian community idea, which also excludes United States. Also, the uh, American-based province in Okinawa um, added the another blow to the U.S.-Japan relationships. But anyway, he stepped down. Mr. Khan came into power. And he started thinking of the, the revitalizing the U.S.-Japan relationships. But on the other hand, the most important trading partner in terms of scale was China at that time. It was true. So, so Japan considering which way we should go. Having FTA with China was the number one trading partner, or well, United States, a very significant political and economic uh, partner. Result, U.S. But U.S. was not interested in having a bilateral FTA, probably with any of the nations after having a such a lengthy process of uh, concluding chorus or FTA with Colombia or Panama. So Japan's choice was to say yes or no to TPP. Coincidentally, Japan was hosting APEC in Yokohama. That's why the, you know, the low pressures, uh, particularly industrial sectors coming into the government, we should join TPP not only to expand the market, but just to join the United States for creating a new economic or rule-making process. But we are not able to say yes. Following the year, new prime minister, as you know, every year we have a new prime minister in Japan, <coughs> Noda Yoshihiko. Noda was very committed to U.S.-Japan relationship again. And he finally saying, we, are, we decided to join TPP. But uh, before realizing it, he stepped down again. But partly because of the, you know, the, he promised to, he worked to upgrade the consumption tax from five to eight, which would be effective next week. I'm a bit concerned anyway. So I asked my wife to buy a lot of stuff before the uh, <laughs> increase of consumption tax. And, uh, anyway. And Mr. Abe came. LDP was initially against it. Partly because of, well, not partly, mainly because of it. A lot of politicians, particularly in the ruling, rural areas, constituencies, strongly against it. Just like the you know, DPJ, which produced Hatea Makan and Noda, just three prime ministers for three years. But Abe actually believed, as I think the, um, someone mentioned already, TPP participation would be helpful for promoting the third arrow of so-called Abenomics. First one, marriage policy, second one, fiscal policy. So far, so good, it seems to me. But the third one, so-called economic growth, more long-term you know, pro projection of the helping economic growth of Japan including the you know, so-called the structural reforms at home. So TPP was considered to be quite significant and useful of tackling this problem. And after meeting with Mr. Obama in February 2013, as I put some stories in my paper anyway, uh, Mr. Abe finally said we are joining it. As a result, Japan officially participated in the negotiation in July 2013. So I put Japan in the center to highlight Japan's position, participating in all three regional integration frameworks. So uh, I highlighted in why Japan was able to do it in my paper again. But again, my talk today is uh, TPP Japan. Well, TPP is useful, but from a Japanese viewpoint, there are few problems. One is bilateralism and multilateralism. 
Again, in 2000, not only Japan, Korea, China, even ASEAN promoted not only regional integration, more bilateral FTAs. Because regional frameworks were quite difficult to promote, particularly based upon ASEAN. ASEAN is you know, the uh, lowest but lower, you know, the uh, common denominator problem. Simply, you know, liberalization ratio should be adjusted to the least enthusiastic free trade country. It would not be necessarily helpful for ASEAN to be brave enough to have a wider regional integration framework. This is the reason why East Asian framework negotiations or some talks momentum stuck. But as I mentioned before, TPP development, particularly after Japan showed an interest in joining it, created a big concern, particularly on part of China. That's the reason why China made a concession, which I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Anyway, so East Asian framework started together with the TPP. That was quite good for Japan. So therefore, just I call the golden opportunity of Japanese trade policy might be coming down. However, I said might be. No, must be. Several problems you have to overcome. But before joining Japan's domestic problems, which is ob obviously related to agricultural liberalization. But TPP had some traps. Number one, again, particularly METI, Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry, which also proposed uh, a simple six framework 2006 or Nikai Shock, emphasized the importance of regional or collective approach to. Uh, trade liberalization because Japanese multinational companies, particularly manufacturing companies, electronics, even automobiles, have quite wide, you know, the expan expanded uh, supply chain network, which means putting a factories for different parts and the assembly should be done, maybe China or some other countries, then exporting them to Europe, United States under the Japanese brand. So in this case, bilateral FTAs was not necessarily helpful in terms of the uh, rule of origin. But if those factories are you know, just allocated to different countries, covered by multilateral frameworks, which country produce which kind of part would not matter. This could be considered to be origins of TPP areas or RCP areas, etc. That is very much helpful for Japan's companies. But currently, bilateralism still exists in terms of market access negotiation in TPP. It may be related to the United States' influence. So currently, 12 countries are negotiating. So eventually, I don't know how many, but a 50-60 bilateral agreement might be uh, created, which confused multinational companies, as often be symbolized as spaghetti ball effect, and reducing the uh, multilateral approach's usefulness. But again, US-Japan putting together accounting for nearly 90% of the total TPP economy Side, should be considered to be key. That's why US and Japan have been heavily engaged in bilateral negotiations. Japan has been asking US to make sort of concessions automobiles. Of course, US asked us to make a liberalization, particularly beef, because this is competitive um, product, particularly against Australia. And Australian trade minister in Japan at the moment for concluding Japan Australia FTA. That may be a quite interesting phenomenon if done, particularly in terms of the, its influence on the U.S. views on that. But this is a sort of the list of the Japanese agricultural products which have never been eliminated or touched in Japanese bilateral FTA, which is currently 12. In TPP, 95% are considered to be a sort of the targeted average uh, liberalization ratio. But Japan's offer, so far, less than 90 percent, even below the uh, developing countries that Japanese FTA partners like Indonesia, Thailand, they offered more. 
So if each part, Japan could be liberalizing to meet the uh, standards of TPP and also the, uh, meet the uh, request from the United States. That is currently discussing in Japan. Last week we have uh, sort of the budget committee in the Japanese diet and Mr. Abe was standing together with agriculture and trade ministers to reply to the questions and the comments raised by the opposition parties. It seems to me uh, still uh, Japanese government is yet to uh, realize it. Okay, let me conclude. TPP, RCP, and CJK, Japan has been engaged. I think each has a different function and meaning. I summarized in each page here. The TPP is a rule-making cutting-edge mechanism establishing more developed nation-oriented trade rules, regulatory coverage, uh, convergences, state-owned enterprises, intellectual property rights, together with the United States. I think that's the reason why China initially worried, but recently showed an interest in TPP. I attended a couple of times in uh, meetings in Beijing, mainly with scholars, but the views and the opinions, it seems to me, have been slightly changing to support China's participation. 2011, 12, 2012, I hardly seen the Chinese scholars, a friend of mine, colleagues, supporting China's participation in TP, but a little bit changed, as I think China's. Chinese colleague just mentioned. But traditional elements still existed. Bilateral agricultural liberalization, which has been always hampering WTO or any other um, trade negotiations so far, despite the fact that TPP is considered to be 21st century high quality regional trading arrangement. RCP, Indonesia, India, China are participating in it. That's all excluded from TPP. It's all important Japanese trading partner. That's why major function with RCP for Japan is to expand market. Also, they employ so-called multilateral common tariff ratio approach. It's very different from TPP, as I mentioned before. That would be also helpful for Japanese multinational companies, particularly who have established the strong supply chain networks in Southeast Asia. Final CJK. Well, as you know, the China, so Japan's political problems with Korea and China still strongly exist. And Mr. Abe, very active in uh, some diplomacy. He visited all ASEAN 10 member countries just within one year at history, but never been meeting with bilaterally with President Park and President Xi. But FTA negotiations have been going on. And one of the negotiators in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that said to us that that's sort of the last consensus formed by China, Japan, Korea trade negotiators. Political impact should be minimized. So we should probably work harder to keep this CJKFT negotiation going on. That could be probably potentially helpful for easing the some political problem existed in Northeast Asia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Trader. Matt? Thank you, Troy. I think I'm going to stay down here. Um, thank you to KEI for inviting me. Uh, thanks to my fellow participants for very interesting presentations that have given me some additional food for thought. Um, and thanks to all of you for uh, coming late on a Thursday night. And I know there are uh, much more interesting panels out there like uh, Buddhist, there is no wealth, more Buddhist wealth accumulation. <laughs> that one sounds very interesting. <laughs> um, and one about animals and humans and Chinese culture and history. That sounded very interesting, too. So I hope we can catch that on tape later. Um, seriously, I'm going to make eight, uh, eight points quickly, um, some of which have already been touched on by uh, my colleagues. Um, I do not have a PowerPoint. I just have wallpaper. Um, First of all, the, the United States uh, is a Pacific power. Uh, that's a matter of geographical fact, as that map shows, a uh, matter of historical fact, a matter of um, our presence in the region, uh, and uh, as a matter of our policy. So uh, that's point one. Point two is that economics has been at the heart of our engagement in uh, the Pacific since before there was a United States. Uh, in 1784, a uh, merchant ship went from New York to Canton to sell ginseng, interestingly, uh, uh, to China in exchange for tea. 
Um, and of course, we sent black ships to Japan and uh, more recently um, you know, helped found APEC and have various bilateral forms of economic engagement. And of course, now we have TPP. So economics has been at the center of our involvement and our engagement in the Asia Pacific uh, from day one. Um, third point, there are three reasons that economics has been at the heart of our engagement, uh, three broad reasons. Uh, the first is uh, growth and jobs. That's where the, the money is, as uh, a famous American bank robber said when asked why he robbed banks. It's where the money is. Um, so obviously this is the most dynamic part of the world and uh, that's why we're drawn to the region. We have enormous economic interests in the region. Um, secondly, it is the part of the world in which uh, the rules of the international system I would argue have been uh, shaped, at least since World War II, uh, and um, importantly shaped. I mean, it been made, this part of the world has made an important contribution to the shaping of international rules, including uh, the uh, emergence of a uh, market-based uh, democratic Japan, and ultimately Korea, Taiwan, other parts of the region. Um, and today, very much is at the heart of rulemaking in the region. Uh, a point that I'm going to come back to on TPP. And thirdly, the reason that economics is important is it reinforces our presence in the region uh, because uh, we have um, a number of other uh, forms of engagement, including alliances and troops and ships and so forth. But uh, economics is what Asia wants from us. They want economic engagement in the region. I mean, they want the ships and troops too, uh, for the most part, but they also want, uh, uh, they don't want to talk about that, but they do want it. Uh, they, but they want the economics, uh, the economic engagement because they want access to our market, they want our technology, um, and they want uh, our leadership in, in economic affairs. Uh, so uh, having a, a, an economic uh, engagement as a part of our overall posture in, in Asia is, is uh, critically important to reinforcing the rest of our presence there. Okay, so that's the third point. The fourth point is that a lot of that economic engagement in the recent past, certainly since 1989, has been focused on regional economic integration. We have bilateral economic arrangements. We even engage in a global sense with Asia uh, by you know, pulling China into the WTO or by, um, uh, by working with half of the G20. Uh, which are also members of, of APEC. So, but it's regional economic integration that has really been the center, central organizing principle of our economic engagement in the region. Um, and that regional economic engage, inter, uh, integration from a U.S. perspective um, or our, the approach that the U.S. has taken to regional economic integration has been, uh, has two primary char characteristics. First of all, it's trans-Pacific in its approach, and that's for obvious reasons, again, uh, for the map shows, because we are a Pacific power, but we are not an Asian country. So of course, to engage in regional economic integration, uh, we, want to be, uh, we want it to be trans-Pacific. But there are also strategic reasons, because we want some of those countries along the eastern side of the Pacific to be engaged uh, in the region, and we want the whole uh, body of water to be considered one. Uh, unit rather than uh, split down the middle, as a former Secretary of State once said. And secondly, we want uh, the, our approach to REI is we want comprehensive liberalization and liberalization at a high standard. Um, and so that's a, a central feature of our regional economic integration um, for uh, certainly the past 25 years. Um, and so that leads to the fifth point, which is the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, is the central organizing principle of our regional economic integration strategy today. Um, and it embodies those two characteristics, even in its name. It is Trans-Pacific, uh, but of course in terms of its membership as well, uh, and in terms of its inspiration in a sense as, as, a, as a regional arrangement uh, uh, for the Pacific Rim. Um, and it meets those three objectives I mentioned of our overall economic engagement in the region, which is growth, rulemaking, and the long-term U.S. presence in the region. It's, it strives for those three, three objectives. Uh, the sixth point is that there are a number of misperceptions about TPP, which uh, 
which are commonly held, and, and uh, I wanted to just talk about a couple of them. Uh, first, that it is in some way designed to contain China. Now, nobody has actually used that term here, although the term isolating China was used. Um, <laughs> and I think the, um, uh, the reality is actually that the TPP, uh, first of all, kind of emerged um, not as a strategy, but as uh, something that we backed into having, um, having uh, in the late Bush administration latched on to a few small uh, members of, of the region that had started a, um, uh, had negotiated a, a free trade arrangement. And the U.S. and that sort of coalitions of the willing uh, era wanted to latch on to this small group of very liberal uh, countries to, uh, uh, to move to the next stage of our uh, trade strategy in the region following uh, the first conclusion of the uh, Korea bilateral uh, FTA with, the, with Korea. Um, and it only later became sort of a strategic push. But the strategy was not focused on excluding China. On the contrary, it was actually designed to pull China in uh, to the global or, and regional rules-based system. Uh, in a sense, it's an extension of the strategy that was adopted by um, uh, previous administrations uh, in supporting China's uh, entry into the WTO, which was uh, from a uh, non-Chinese, from a Chinese perspective, that was designed to support domestic economic reform. From a non-Chinese perspective, that was designed to help pull China more deeply into the global rules-based system. And similarly, TPP was and is designed to do that. So that's the, the right way to look at TPP, not as a, an effort to exclude or contain China. I mean, every member of TPP, including the United States, wants to deepen its economic engagement with China, not to exclude them. Um, uh, another common misperception is that is the TPP is, is inconsistent with some of the other uh, arrangements that are being negotiated in the region, including the ones that have been mentioned, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership and uh, the Korea uh, Japan, uh, China, FTA, um, and in a in a in a narrow sense, uh, it's true. Those are on different tracks, and there is uh, some uh, possibility of trade diversion as a as a result of those separate negotiations. But overall, uh, analysis has shown that the uh, that the the net impact of all of these negotiations will be trade creating. And indeed, um, the best analysis uh, in the U.S. Of, of these different tracks of negotiations, which was done um, by Peter Petri of Brandeis University and colleagues uh, for the Peterson Institute in late uh, 2012, uh, they did a macroeconomic, I mean, an econometric analysis of the impact of these different tracks and concluded that uh, each TPP and the Asian track, as it was called then, because it wasn't yet called uh, RCEP, uh, would each produce substantial uh, income gains for the world. Uh, T RCEP, interestingly, a little more than TPP because the level of current uh, barriers or the level of opportunity for increased uh, liberalization and trade was greater in, in RCEP. Um, but together, if these two agreements ultimately were to uh, merge or to converge into a single uh, or be converted into a single uh, FTAP, a free trade area of the Asia Pacific, or something like that, a, a broad regional agreement, that that uh, combined uh, project could uh, produce annual, annual global, in global income gains of as much as $2 trillion by 2025, 1.9 something trillion dollars per year globally by 2025, if those two uh, under some realistic assumptions about those, those agreements coming together. And there is a way that these agreements can actually be stitched together, starting with uh, some of the lower hanging fruit like uh, the, the, uh, the trade facilitation elements and other parts of these uh, that, are, that are in all these agreements, um, customs rules and various other things. And personally, uh, and more importantly, on behalf of CSIS, uh, we have um, encouraged a uh, start of a, of a discussion of how those, uh, those two tracks can be brought together um, and ultimately other tracks as well uh, through work on particularly that supply chain, value chain part of, the, um, of, part of all of these agreements. Um, so that's what everybody should be aiming for. 
Um, so I've paused a lot on the misperception. I'm happy to talk more about that. But let me just say my seventh and eighth points. The seventh point is the TPP must succeed from a U.S. perspective. It is central to uh, the so-called rebalancing strategy of the Obama administration, uh, which is um, another way of, in a sense, emphasizing the importance of the Asia Pacific, which the last seven or eight presidents going back to Richard Nixon have emphasized, and the next seven or eight presidents are going to continue to emphasize. But for the Obama administration, uh, TPP, you know, as I said, is the organizing principle of its economic engagement with the Asia Pacific region, and as such, uh, it must succeed. Um, and uh, if it does not succeed, it's going to be uh, a, a huge blow to uh, the U.S. strategy overall in the Asia Pacific. If it does succeed, it's going to completely change the narrative about the U.S. interest and presence and engagement and commitment to the region. Um, and so my final point, to end optimistically, is that TPP will succeed, um, I believe. Um, I'm not going to, like every good economist I, um, or for economic forecaster, um, we're told that you can, uh, you can uh, pick a number or pick a date, but just don't pick both of them. So I will pick the number, which is 100% certainty that TPP will be achieved, but I will not say when. <laughs> um, and, um, but I do think I, I'm probably the least pessimistic person in Washington. I didn't say optimistic, but I'm the least pessimistic person <laughs> about the current prospects for for TPP in the sense that uh, the U.S. and Japan, as Tarada Sensei mentioned, uh, are in the middle of some pretty intense negotiations, literally as we speak, uh, they are meeting in Washington uh, to try to work out the, uh, these differences on, on agriculture market access in particular and a little bit of autos as well. Uh, but uh, I actually have reason to believe that uh, the negotiators are not as far apart as people think, and that there is a possibility that there could be um, a, a, uh, a breakthrough or at least an agreement in principle on those issues and uh, before President Obama goes to Asia. I'm not actually predicting that, but I think it's a possibility uh, that's greater than zero. And if that were to happen, uh, it would have a uh, earth-shattering impact on these negotiations because uh, uh, in, it would have an impact in the negotiating room where I think all other issues would fall away. Uh, and I think in, the, um, in, in Washington it would have a, again, like an earthquake uh, because we've been waiting for 30 years uh, for this outcome. And if we were able to achieve it, it would be enormous. So I think it would have tremendous, it would put tremendous political wind behind the sales of TPP. So I'm going to end with that optimistic note, or unpessimistic note, uh, because I'm not, as I say, I, I seriously understand that these are very difficult issues, and I think there is a um, you know, substantial risk that the, the two sides will not be able to come together, but I do think there's a possibility, and I'm certainly uh, uh, very hopeful that there will be an agreement uh, soon. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Matt. And uh, just, uh, I regrettably, I guess, a little known fact, uh, Dr. Petri actually presented that work here at AAS okay. first uh, for us. I'm not sure if our final paper came out before the Peterson one, but uh -huh. yeah, the first Great. presentation was actually at one of our panels at AAS. Great. Um, what I'm going to say is um, if any of the speakers have any comments they would like to make uh, on each other's presentations, why don't we take a couple of minutes for that? Uh, but otherwise, I have a question, and then we'll open it up to uh, the audience. So if anyone has any just... Uh, Comments real quick. I, I would. Could I just make a point about um, uh, Mr. Su's presentation, which is that about Korea and TPP. Uh, I, I think his analysis was was excellent, and and I think most of his points I completely agree with. I do think one thing you didn't emphasize, but uh, that I think is important to state, is that from a substantive point of view, it would actually not be very hard for Korea to join TPP because the. Uh, TPP uh, framework is based very much on the U.S.-Korea free trade agreement um, template. And uh, so Korea has already um, agreed to most of the disciplines that are being negotiated in TPP and, uh, uh, and, um, and has already made most of the political, the hard political decisions about uh, market access that would be required of it in TPP. So actually, um, if Korea were, um, uh, uh, you know, willing to move uh, into TPP and we weren't at such a difficult stage of the TPP negotiations where I think it's difficult to envisage bringing any other country into the room, 
um, I, I think actually it would be relatively straightforward and, and I don't think inconsistent with the other, um, the other uh, priorities that, that Korea rightly has for a trilateral um, and, uh, and, and for RCEP and so forth. Yeah, Dr. Trey. Or do you have a, I guess, a quick response, Dr. Sada? Okay, Dr. Sada, then Dr. Trey. Okay, thank you very much. Well, just following Marshall's comment, I also touch on the uh, TPP and Korea. I think the Korea's one of the most concerned element in joining TPP is actually Japan, because TPP means Japan Korea FTA, and that would suddenly um, negatively affecting the uh, Korea's trade with Japan. You know, the trade deficit had to be probably mounted, and etc. And also politically, it would be quite, quite difficult, you know, the item at the moment and uh, situations. And um, I think another point was the how about CJK? That would also mean Japan Korea FTA. But interestingly, I touched on this point in my paper too. Um, China has been now taking, as far as I hear, um, so called the um, see how it goes. It means TPP because TPP currently has been well, broke down despite the university's um, least pessimistic <laughs> views on the development. Rate. But the negotiation itself, particularly Japan-U.S. negotiations, have been quite you know, well reported, particularly in East Asia, uh, so-called, uh, again, possibly taking one more year to conclude. So in this case, China may be not necessarily motivated to promote CJK, FTA, including Japan. So as uh, Dr. So mentioned, you know, the China, Korea FTA could be probably promoted first. That would be creating a big pressure on Japan because the Chinese market could be open first to Korean manufacturing products because uh, Korea's FTA with the EU and the European Un uh, Union and also USA would be also creating a huge problem on Japan. Because 50 or 60 percent, it depends on the year, you know, the Japanese and Korean exports are competing. So I think that China is a huge market. Suddenly, it's a big weapon for China to utilize to put the pressure on Japan. So uh, in summary, TPP development is quite significant for both U.S.-Japan, also Japan-Korea, Japan-China relationships. Thank you. Dr. Sa. Okay. And, uh, I want to make uh, only one uh, point, and uh, Mathieu has said uh, maybe uh, there is a no significant big cost when the Korea uh, joined TPP. Uh, that is a, a kind of some general view, but uh, if you focus on the, some the uh, market access factor uh, in the field of on the market access, and then still the Korea uh, has a very uh, significant depends position in the liberali liberalization on agricultural market. You know, the, still the one of the very political item, the rice, rice is still uh, is not uh, uh, always uh, excluded in any kinds of FTA which uh, the Korea government has already uh, uh, joined. Okay, and. Uh, also, in a manufacturing sector, actually, the most of a CEO, like a Hyundai or a Gia CEO said, and actually, get, uh, they uh, recognize uh, TPP as a, not TPP. It, 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 they recognize TPP as a, a bilateral FTA negotiation with uh, Japan. Not the, uh, not the United States. So usually, uh, if you uh, see the, my uh, whole paper, and then why uh, uh, the CEO, uh, the most uh, manufacturing sectors uh, think about that uh, DPP, because uh, the most of the trade deficit came from the uh, trade with Japan, particularly the manufacturing sector. So the uh, uh, currently, uh, in my uh, personal opinion, is currently why the Korean government is hesitate to join the DPP. That is uh, one reason. Uh, if the uh, uh, entry cost is really huge, for example, uh, 
uh, Korea uh, should uh, liberalize all kinds of manufacturing, manufacturing sector, uh, like uh, uh, auto and uh, its auto part. And then uh, uh, maybe uh, it is very, uh, the, the Park uh, administration will face a very uh, hard, severe opposition uh, of that joining the TPP. And um, uh, other, the bilateral uh, uh, FTA with uh, China or uh, uh, Japan, and uh, I think uh, the bilateral uh, FTA with Japan as a, can be easily, but the problem is, uh, you know, the so the political issue still the uh, one of the major uh, uh, factor for not going smoothly that the uh, FTA negotiation with China. But uh, uh, I guess uh, with the uh, uh, Japan, the, uh, with the China, the bilateral the FTA with China, uh, in my personal opinion, will be uh, concluded within this year or near future. I think so. Yeah. That's all. Thank you, Dr. Sun. Well, you know, I guess my question would be, I was, you know, Matt, you ended it with, you know, the 100% guarantee that TPP will happen. <laughs> and, you know, Dr. Su, you know, in your presentation, you talked about this idea of maybe a reduced RCEP. Huh. And so, you know, there's been a shift, I would say, maybe in the rhetoric and a lot of discussion in the last year in terms of, you know, architectural integration within East Asia, you know, with China perhaps being more interested, with, you know, less discussion of, you know, what we'll say the broader political maybe implications are for TPP or other. But, you know, what is the possibility that despite all of the, you know, high rhetoric and tension that we saw over the debate, you know, whether, you know, TPP was isolating China, whether RCEP was the way most countries would go or not, that maybe we end up in a different place. Um, you know, there's, you know, difficulties on the TPP side just, you know, within the U.S. in terms of us getting trade promotion authority and when that might happen. Um, so what are the possibilities, one, that maybe we don't end up where many people thought we were going to end up in terms of architectural structure in East Asia? And two, do we end up maybe somewhere more like, um, and you know, Matt touched on this briefly, uh, where Dr. Petri and uh, Dr. Plummer had sort of suggested in almost, and I'm going to put this in a different way, you know, in the EU there's often the discussion of a two-speed Europe to where countries who want to move ahead do so, but then other countries sort of follow as they can. And so that RCEP and TPP end up working together in that sense of you get a two-speed Asia to where you have countries who have the highest level of liberalization who start off on this one path, but then they're joined eventually by the other countries. And that we sort of have this melding in that type of sense. Anyone or? <laughs> Um, well, I mean, I, I think, um, if I understood your questions, I mean, I think that the, uh, you know, I think that if, on your first point, if, if you're saying, I mean, I think that if TPP, uh, TPP has already been a game changer in a sense, because I think there was a lot of skepticism. F first of all, I mean, to be totally fair, as I said, I don't think TPP was a particular big deal in substance until Japan joined. I mean, once Japan joined, um, as, as um, uh, I guess it was uh, Professor Su showed, uh, you know, that this group became a, you know, a substantial, um, a substantial economic area. Um, and uh, I think also it had a strategic impact because it, it did put this, I think, I, I wanted to ask actually Professor Zhang his view on whether Japan's joining TPP helped change the debate within China about TPP because I certainly sensed it was around the time that China joined, that Japan joined or decided to join, that um, that people in China started to look at TPP a little bit differently and look at it not as something that might be uh, uh, something China should stay away from, but something that potentially China needed to be either part of or needed to um, have some other response to by its own domestic reform. You mentioned the Shanghai FTZ. Uh, I would also cite the U.S.-China Bilateral Investment Treaty position China took on that changed quite dramatically around that same time. 
So I wonder whether it was having an impact in terms of the view that this was the main place in which the, the rules of the international, or at least the regional trading system were going to be uh, set in practice. Uh, whether that was the right group of countries, whether it was good that the United States was leading it or not, uh, it, it was de facto the place where, where the rules were going to be set. And I just wonder whether that, that was part of the, the thing that changed um, Chinese calculations in kind of about a year ago uh, in, the, in the spring of uh, late winter, early spring of 2013. Um, so, uh, sorry, I sort of maybe took that in a slightly different direction. But to me, it, you know, the TPP uh, evolution has really changed the debate. Now, if TPP fails, then I think we're back in a different world. But I think if it continues to move forward, then, then I think it becomes uh, the de facto centerpiece of then what I think will be a broader regional conversation because personally, I don't think any country is ever going to, maybe a small country, and maybe Korea, because it's not so far apart from TPP, will ever accede to TPP. I, I, I say that again. I don't think almost any country will ever accede to TPP um, because it's too difficult for, say, a China or an Indonesia or, a, 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 um, or I think even a... Uh, a, a middle-sized country to to accede to a, a, a regional agreement that it was not originally a founding member of. I just think that's too difficult. So I think instead they're going to leapfrog to a conversation about a broader free trade area of the Asia Pacific uh, that would involve you know the broadly defined whole Asia Pacific region, including China, Indonesia, Korea. Uh, Philippines and others. So, well, um, no. so can I say a few words? Um, so, actually, I want to make two comments. One is to, uh, in response to um, um, uh, Matthew's point question, actually, and the second point is about two um, emerging notions of, of regionalism which are different. Um, the first point about uh, whether China um, is more worried uh, after <coughs> Japan announced its intention to join the TPP. I would say uh, no. Um, the moment China was most worried or unrelaxed I think it was around 2010, 2011. At the time, China uh, mainly saw TPP as a diplomatic strategic vehicle. And China uh, was highly suspicious of the US intention of pushing through uh, the TPP, uh, mainly as a diplomatic and strat political strategic uh, vehicle. But after a while, into 2012, 2013, I think China is much more uh, relaxed when the U.S. explained its intention, uh, when China also, um, mainly I think it's the ASEAN who, who proposed ASEP, and China also making some progress in uh, launching the CJKFT together with uh, Japan and South Korea. Um, and in terms of economics, uh, China's uh, export structure, commodities are different from Japan's exports commodities. Japan is at more high advanced uh, level of electronic and mechanical products to the U.S. market and to other um, TP members markets. So we are at different segment of exported ma uh, products. Um, and in the future, I think China would be more and more um, relaxed um, because China is gradually finding its own way of pushing um, the Asian economic integration which is link, uh, related to the, my, the, the second point I want to make. I would say that TPP um, is actually distracting, distracting the attention of whole Asia's economic integration. TPP is not innovative at all it actually brings us back to the 20th century, 1980s, 1990s. So basically, it's EPAC. 
uh, idea of uh, Asia Pacific FTA. It doesn't really advance our ideas of regional economic integration. Um, that reminds me of the European way of European integration because in 1950s or 1960s there are also two there was a big debate about a UK-led free, uh, European free trade area, EFTA, and also a Franco-German-led approach of economic integration, which is more uh, a common market, uh, a community approach. And I think that uh, for some time, uh, some Asian countries, including Japan, China, South Korea, are trying a community approach uh, but due to various factors, this approach did not advance much. But personally, I would say this approach uh, should represent the future of Asian economic integration, including uh, the interconnections, including um, freer flow of um, factors of, of production, production, exchange of people and more convergence of ideologies, you know, the traditional cultural factors. I think for Asia's peace and prosperity, it's better uh, for us to take the approach, the path of community building, as China is now advocating of, of, of building a community of common um, destiny and also building a community of common interest. I think that's something more um, advancing and more innovative, but I, I recognize that still uh, at a very premature uh, stage. But for FTAs, I don't see it is really advanced. I think sooner or later we need to go beyond the FTA stage to more uh, integrated approach, including common currency, including single market. I think here, a uh, European way of uh, integration has some inspirations for us, even though I, I recognize the differences between Asian integration and European integration. Thank you. Oh, you have something to say? Mm -hmm. Okay, the, uh, I want to make uh, one comment um, about the, the reduced form of RCEP. The, you know, the uh, diversity is uh, the very important feature of current the Asian society. So uh, I think uh, the number of current RCEP member countries is 16, and also the, the difference is very huge. So uh, I need uh, some the feasible and the fast uh, speed of RCEP uh, negotiation, and that is kinds of uh, reduced form of RCEP. So the the reduced form of RCEP can be a, a step stoning on the final the conclusion of the whole whole size of RCEP country. That is, uh, I think uh, that uh, maybe a feasible uh, solution to 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 getting the uh, the conclusion of the small size of RCEP. That is more uh, feasible, and uh, that is also can be a uh, rivalry to current TPP. I think. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Matt? I, I just wanted to respond to, to, to Professor Zhang because um, I, I, think, I think his point about Asian community building makes sense to me through a non-economic prism. Uh, that there may be that aspiration for, you know, Asia community. Um, and that's not my area of expertise, so I, I can't comment on that. But from an economic perspective, uh, other than one thing that you said, which I agree with, which is the TPP does not, by not including everybody in Asia, does not fully reflect the underlying uh, patterns of supply chains and value chains within the region, and that's a problem. So that, that ultimately has to change over time through, you know, convergence of these different approaches. Um, or by accession, you know, of other countries to TPP, if that's possible. Um, but otherwise, I actually think that uh, the economics of TPP are very much in the flow and consistent with uh, the 
visible, revealed economic interests of a country like China. So, for example, your uh, latest reform, uh, ambitious reform package that was announced at the third plenum last November uh, incorporates many of the specific um, objectives and um, uh, elements of the TPP agenda, um, including uh, disciplines on state-owned enterprises, uh, which perhaps in a narrow sense as a, um, as a matter of um, the actual text of the rules that are being negotiated in TPP may be too difficult for China to agree to today. But the thrust of the third party plenum uh, was that the market is going to have a decisive role and uh, that there will be, um, uh, there will be a different uh, role for uh, state owned enterprises in the economy. Um, so, uh, and, and there are many other elements of the third party, uh, the third plenum reform package, which uh, strike me as very much consistent with the thrust of what TPP is, uh, is aiming to achieve. So I actually, and, and I could cite, you know, other countries in the region that similarly have uh, a desire to um, adopt some of those so-called 21st century uh, um, uh, rules and approaches uh, because uh, it's, in their, it's in their best economic interest. So I think from that perspective, TPP is very much consistent with, um, with the Asian approach, in my view. All right. We'll make Dr. Trader's comment the last, so that way we can then engage the audience. Okay, very quickly, um, I take a view that TPP and RCP's convergence or merging would be very, very difficult. So I take those two different frameworks are very separated, or maybe completely different entity, maybe completely, but quite different entity. Well, number one, particularly from the politics viewpoint, membership is different. So in this case, you know, how do you know, two regional institutions come together without different members? And particularly, if you uh, consider the RCEP merging with TPP, that would mean the United States would join the RCP. But in this case, U.S. might need to take a one condition, which means U.S. need to have a bilateral FTA with ASEAN, because RCP's guiding line actually said and this should be content, you know, this should be based upon the ASEAN plus one FTA. And E3, uh, promoted by Obama administrations, uh, were quite interesting and useful uh, guidance for looking at the, how the American or U.S. could have FTA with an ASEAN. Uh, but still, I think the uh, U.S. need to take some ASEAN's you know, preferences, flexibility is one of them, and technical and diplomatic cooperation uh, clause should be also included. But as far as I read E3, if I were wrong, please correct me. Uh, these kind of elements, particularly America's engagement in uh, Mekong River development issues, is sort of the missing point particularly from the Japanese and the Chinese and uh, interest in ASEAN. So uh, I, I think we need to take such kind of gradual steps to considering the you know, complete convergence of TPP and RCP. Of course, RCP-TPP merging also means that you know, China and India needs to have a co uh, negotiation for integration. That also means the uh, mini WTO round. I don't think many countries would be happy to see that, particularly looking at uh, such a lengthy process of the uh, DOFA development round, taking more than 15 or 16 years for conclusion, not conclusion perfectly yet. So um, again, uh, ideally, uh, ideally, ideally, sorry, well, convergence would be quite useful, particularly in terms of the users of the regional integration or FTAs which is a multinational company. However, um, such a political and even realistic economic situation would simply make it for us to consider that would come to the um, conclusion quite shortly. Maybe 10 years, maybe two, 20 years. I don't know, but uh, just looking at current situation, it would be very difficult, I think. Thank you. Now, uh, any questions from the audience? Bill? I have a question for John. Um, you 
can tell us the, the, the ideal for economic integration of China. One currency and uh, sense of community. Can you, can you give us more of a sense of this debate in China and uh, who's pressing for who's advocating this and uh, what it means? Because after all, in Europe, you have such a balance of countries, Germany and France and others, whereas in East Asia, China is becoming so much more dominant. Are we talking rightly about the renminbi being the currency and is this uh, China's sort of leadership in the community rather than ASEAN leadership? How, how does this discussion play out in China? If I could just add one little caveat to that. You know, in the euro, which has obviously had problems, the Deutsche Mark was sort of the strong foundational currency. But if you look at East Asia, um, you know, setting aside that the RMB isn't, you know, internationally convertible yet, it's hard to see the yen or another currency in the region playing that role. So I guess what would the currency foundation be? Hmm? Well, um, the community idea actually, um, we are we have two step here uh, or two type of communities. Um, one type is recognized by the central government, and the other is not, um, or, or, or partially recognized by the, by the central government policymakers. Um, the first type of community is community of common interest. I think it is mainly advocated by some senior Chinese scholars. Uh, that idea uh, originally come from uh, um, two sources. One source is common interest. Uh, which is advocated by President Jiang Zemin during his visit uh, in the United States, meeting with Bill Clinton, President Bill Clinton. And they also, because at the time, back in 1997, China and the United States uh, uh, working, worked together to build a constructive strategic partnership, which was uh, later overturned by President George W. Bush, who saw China-U.S. relationship a more competitive rivalry relationship. But that idea remained common interest. So com community of common interest basically uh, reflected China's in intention of emphasizing common interest uh, between China and its uh, neighbors and also between China and other major countries. Um, the second uh, source of common, the community of common interest came from um, uh, Bob Zolik's idea about uh, having China as a responsible stakeholder. Um, well, the second type of community um, is community of common destiny, um, which has already been written into um, the report of the 18th Party Congress. So we see the world as uh, in highly interdependent. Uh, mankind has only one planet, so we share uh, a common destiny. So whether it is between China and Japan, whether it's between China and Korea, or between China and the, and the United States, or China and Russia, uh, we want to build a, a community of common uh, destiny because we only have, we, we, we share destiny. Uh, so does that reflect China's intention to play a leading role in the, in the region or, or in the rest of the world? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think so. I think that the, the com community of common interest um, is simply aspirations, uh, ideal, just like President Hu Jintao uh, advocated a harmonious world, full stop. It doesn't mean that China is the leader of that harmonious world. Um, I think that obviously the United States uh, is playing a, a leadership role um, everywhere, uh, everywhere. Um, but China, of course, uh, wants to see a more um, multipolar world uh, together with other uh, countries, including Russia, including France. Um, China's currency, RMB, uh, in the region, I think it happens uh, very naturally, I think, that China has some uh, current swap agreements with neighboring countries, including Russia. And China doing a lot of trade. Basically, China is uh, number one trading partner for most of its neighbors. And uh, even for a lot of Latin American countries, so gradually they, they, they see that RMB um, um, increasing increasing role. Um, 
if we look at European experience, um, having one single currency has been their um, long-held aspirations for three decades, starting from 1970s, and finally in 1999 they launched Euro. Um, whether Chinese currency will become Euro or maybe Chinese currency, Japanese yen, Korean dollar, a basket becomes, for example, Asian dollar or Asian, Asian currency. I think this is something already some scholars and some policymakers are advocating for, for a long period of time. So I'm not sure uh, whether China would become a, a, a single currency for the whole Asian region or there will be a combination of different currencies. Um, I, I'm not quite sure. Okay. Any other questions? Well, there is one thing that comes to mind then. Um, you know, since we've brought in sort of the European example a little bit now and everything, um, you know, Matt, you had said that you see it being very difficult for a country to accede to TPP. Um, admittedly, the European Union has many other aspects to it, but that is one significant regional trade agreement where countries have acceded to afterwards. Um, is the difficulty with TPP because it is, in essence, I guess you could say one dimensional, that it's not a political, sort of diplomatic, larger arrangement? Or are there other, uh, I guess, obstacles you see to accession beyond that? Or just the European example, just so unique that it yeah. doesn't really apply? I, I think that's the thing. I think the European and Asian situations are so different, it's very hard to draw those comparisons. It's easy to, you know, to sort of want to make those comparisons because, because it is the, the best model out there. Um, that, that, that seems relevant, but I, I think there are some pretty substantial uh, differences, including, I mean, I think, again, I'm, I'm more of an Asia expert than I am a, a, a Europe expert, but, um, but ultimately the European project was, was driven centrally by a, first and foremost, by a, by a political uh, impulse, uh, you know, to stop France and Germany from shooting at each other. Um, you know, let's let's be honest. That's where it that's where it started, and so uh, so everything was built sort of around that. Now it's not that there aren't challenges like that in Asia, but that's not the central organizing principle of uh, these issues that we're talking about. I think they're driven much more by uh, by economic uh, interests and um, uh, first and foremost. And so. You know, I don't know how much uh, relevance there is. I, I just think that the, and I, I think that the, you know, the the aspiration of, of particularly the Eastern European countries that were emerging from the Soviet period or had emerged from the Soviet period. I guess we have to change our grammar now. Uh, let's hope that they continue to remain um, emerged from uh, from that uh, previous uh, reality. Um, very much had an aspiration to join and were willing to take the political you know, the balance of political interest was, you know, strongly in favor of, of moving in that direction. Um, whereas I think in this dynamic in, in Asia, it's just going to be much harder for countries that have not already made the decision to join as of, say, today. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, that's why I say Korea, Philippines, Taiwan, if there weren't other problems with Taiwan, I think maybe you could see exceeding. But, um, but beyond that, I don't see anybody ex uh, being, being able to make the political calculation required to, to join this thing. So I think you leapfrog to some other, other thing in the region that's broader. Okay. All right. Well, if there are no other questions, um, please join me in thanking our panelists for a very interesting and in-depth discussion on these <laughs>